everybody. Dr. Gusso here on the campus of the University of Mississippi and for once today I'm coming to you really in my in my I'm wearing my scholar's hat in my guise as a scholar because so I've got something really exciting to share with you a little bit different for this channel um, you know and we will always continue to play the harmonica but as you know I'm a professor of English and Southern Studies here at Ole Miss and a about three years ago actually about six years ago a friend of mine said he, a friend of mine from Nigeria, one of my colleagues, Adetayo Alabi, Tayo, came into my office. He was editing a journal that we publish out of our English department at the University of Mississippi. It's called The Global South, which is sort of, in the world of Southern Studies, the idea of the Global South is kind of a big, a big thing. And he said, How would, what would you think about maybe guest editing an issue at some point? And I said, well, there's only one thing I could really do an issue on. It would be kind of the blues in global context. And he said, good. We'll do that. And little did I know what I, what I was about to embark on. So over the past three years, I have solicited articles for uh, a, a special issue of the Global South. It's actually the title change slide. It's called Blues Music in Transnational Context. That's academic ease, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of language that we use. Blues heard around the world. How did blues music spread around the world? And what is it doing in all those different places? And what are foreign-born blues musicians doing in the American blues scene and like how does it all work how does it all fit together and that I'm coming to you today to say we've got some answers for you and actually I'm holding a copy of uh, an essay that I published so let me just give you the basics it's the Global South it's issue 14.1 and I'm going to give you two links one is a link that will that let you download my introductory article for free. I can't believe that Indiana University Press that publishes this thing is letting us do this, but they are. I'm giving you the fruits of my scholarship, and it's a really interesting article. It's called Bien al Sur, Notes Towards a Genealogy of Blues Music's Global Spread. Now, you know, I understand that many of you are like, oh my god, I'm playing blues harmonica to get away from school. Well, so am I. What do you think I'm doing here off in this corner? jamming on harp but blues is really interesting stuff so bien al sir i learned this from uh i want to make sure i get their names right gabriel grazer and martin sasson bien al sir historia del blues in uh, uh, on la argentina so turns out that there's like this wonderful history of the blues in spanish i don't read spanish but i you know i google translate by these two scholars in argentina Bial Sur means way down south. Now, there's that's funny. I mean, that's funny. Argentina, way down south. I'm coming to you from Mississippi, but relative to here, that's way the heck down south. Bial Sur. So I decided I would call my article that. I'm going to give you a link to my article. I'm going to tell you in just a minute. I'm going to kind of talk through the what I've done. And then I'm going to give you a link that will take you to a place where you can at least see you can long for the complete issue all eight articles mine and the seven others that's behind a paywall if you have access to a university library that has a subscription to something called JSTOR you can get it you'll be able to download it for free otherwise you can pay 15 bucks an article seems like a lot but you know we worked really hard in this thing and IUP Indiana University Press is trying to make something out of it so the issue has articles by seven scholars apart from mine right so I and, and my my article is going to give you like a brief survey and I will do that it, it towards the latter part of this video but the seven scholars two of them are right about Africa one of them is, he's an Indian scholar one of my grad students in fact former grad students and one is a scholar from Senegal and they write about the blues in African context not roots of the blues in the traditional way at all this is going to blow your mind then I got two people who are writing about the blues in a UK context I'll talk about that then I got Two people are writing about the blues. One, the Swedish blues scene, and another about a Japanese blues musician in Chicago. Fascinating. And finally, I have a seventh article is on a um, it, a, an Afrikadian blues poet. If you've never heard of Afrikadian, then you're going to learn something from this. I thought I wanted to try to tell a sort of the largest story so I figured well first thing I need to do as a scholar like somebody obviously must have said here's how blues music went from being basically something in the US South the black South kind of ended up being in 150 countries around the world I was unable to find any 
blue scholar who had actually tried to do that. So that's one thing I've done. I've tried to do something that I don't believe anybody else has done. They did bits and pieces. I've assembled all the bits and pieces. I researched for a couple of years. You know, you dig and you dig and, 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 and that's what you find is sometimes you find nobody's done this. So I'm trying to kind of like a, like a spider trying to string some basic chords prior to the, and then like a web that's not really that fine, but I did the best I could. So it's all subject to revision. And uh, there, there's actually sort of six stages. Maybe I should, I'll read you the abstract and then I'll just kind of very quickly take you through the article and professors aren't very quick, but I'll try to do that. The hist this is the abstract. This is a sort of summary. The history of blues music includes, or should include, an account of the way in which this substantially African-American creation, a product of the U.S. South and the Great Migration, has been transformed over the past century into a global phenomenon, one performed by local musicians and embraced by audiences in virtually every corner of the world. Since that comprehensive account of the blues globalization has yet to be written, this introductory essay offers a provisional outline based on what is currently known, a knowledge base notably augmented by the seven essays addressing this issue's theme, blues music in transnational context. The globalization process takes place in six roughly sequential stages, I argue, beginning with the music's transatlantic migration from the U.S. to the U.K. and Europe in the 1950s and early 1960s, an early diffusion framed by British and continental blues scholarship. The U.K. blues scene isn't just the first non-U.S. scene to achieve critical mass, but the male blues rock artists it promotes, especially the Rolling Stones and Cream, end up critically inflecting the aesthetics of emergent scenes in Europe and beyond. B.B. King, touring widely and frequently outside the U.S., is a key agent of blues global spread. The International Blues Challenge in Memphis stages an annual rite of return for the widespread cohort of blues musicians produced by globalization, even as digital technologies radically democratize the performative playing field, enabling musicians such as Luna Lee, a young South Korean YouTuber, to seek and consolidate global audiences. So that's my attempt to sort of summarize my thing. Right away, I want to say there's something in there that I that I clearly don't agree with that you probably don't and it's undercut by my first epigram which if I read to you you'll get why I'm thinking oh my god I left that out this is a quote from um, Langston Hughes in an essay from 1941 called songs called the blues this is what Hughes said the most famous blues as everybody knows is the St. Louis blues that Mr. W.C. Hindi wrote down one night on the corner of a bar on a levee street in St. Louis 30 years ago and which has since gone all over the world. He sang this in 1941. The St. Louis blues is sung more than any other song on the airwaves, is known in Shanghai and Buenos Aires, Paris and Berlin. In fact, is heard so often in Europe that a great many Europeans think it must be the American national anthem. The blues have something that goes beyond race or sectional limits that appeals to the ear and heart of a people everywhere. Otherwise, how could it be that in a Tokyo restaurant one night, I heard a Louis Armstrong record of the St. Louis blues played over and over for a crowd of Japanese diners there? So, first thing that has to be said, prior to the 1950s, there was a long prehistory of blues music and blues on recordings. So that's the first thing that has to be said. Hughes is saying, it's, in some sense, it was W.C. Handy and his music being known around the world that sort of set the stage. What I'm doing is saying, okay, given that prehistory, when do things really kind of begin to come online? And so I'm looking, starting mostly in the 1950s. But there's a history even in, in the UK in the 1940s that one of my authors talks about. So so that's, that's the sort of basic point. I'm going to talk you through it. I'm going to give you some visuals too. kind of talk you through the six stages a and one of the things that interests me when people talk about the blues they get cranky and judgmental and so some people might be tempted to say well you know I mean like what they're playing in I don't know what they're doing for blues in Argentina but it's not the real thing I'm utterly uninterested in that way of thinking about blues I'm an empiricist I want to know if somebody says blues is black music I they might be prescriptive. They might be mean like basically, if it ain't a black person doing it, Sugar Blue said basically, if I'm going to hear blues, I want to hear a black a black guy doing it. Um, I, I don't. I'm not thinking about blues in global context that way. I want to know how the music spread, and I consider anybody around the world who's playing something they call blues to be playing blues. I'm not judging it. That's really an important thing to understand here because I think our conversation 
about the blues is far too restricted to sort of black and white wrestling in America. It's a much bigger story than that. So I call this a, d a descriptive grammar in the form of six stages, roughly sequential, kind of like first, second, but also overlapping and continuing to the present day through which that spread, that movement of this thing called blues from America everywhere has taken place, okay? So this is sort of what I call a first pass attempt. Stage number one, African-American blues musicians travel out of the U.S. to perform overseas. And this stage, by the way, has some subsets, but that's one of the things. And so the American Folk Blues Festival, which grows from 62 to 72 and then it gets reanimated, is huge. It brings the cream of the crop uh, of, uh, of African-American, all black artists, African-American, through into the heart of Europe for huge concert audiences. So Big Bill Brunzi, B.B. King, um, some of these people stay overseas, some of these musicians. So Champion Jack Dupree, Memphis Slim, Eddie Boyd, Luther Allison stay overseas and they, and they, they help create sort of local, potent local blues scenes in Europe, right? And they do recordings and so European blues artists get a chance to work with these American guys and cut their teeth and sort of learn these African American musicians, right? But there, it's not just of course about American musicians, black American musicians, projecting themselves overseas. Again, I have to stress that. This is about blues begins with these things. As a part of this stage one, recordings are extremely important. Recordings of African-American artists that make their way to Europe, especially in a post-war period. Radio is really important. Armed force, the armed forces network and, and the British equivalent, which is to say American military radio, British military radio, they're going, and I think this is something that's been totally ignored. They're all around the world. They're all around the world. They have their military bases. Local people in Asia, for example, I have one incredible quote, are, are, they're listening to the radio, they're hearing this stuff. What are they hearing? Well, I'll talk in a sec about that. And they're saying, blues, wow. That's one of the things that drives it. And film and television. So the Blues and Gospel Train in 64 in the UK, um, the CBC has something called The Blues. Um, with Barney McGee, Willie Dixon, Muddy Waters. And then, of course, you know, later on, the Blues Brothers, uh, Crossroads, B.B. King and Friends. That's number one. Stage number one. Stage number two, books, magazines, liner notes, and other print media offer compelling representations of African-American blues musicians, their music, and their socio-historical milieu. So, very important. I can't be overstressed. European blues scholars precede American blues scholars, and Paul Oliver is critically important. He publishes six books basically during the 60s, uh, starting with sort of Blues Fell This Morning in 1960. Now, of course, we have Sam Charters, The Country Blues in 59, 1960, Paul Oliver. And so the, the, the English and, and more broadly the sort of European blues scholars create this image of the blues man. They're actually more focused to some extent on the men than on the women. This, this becomes important. Now in Japan, the, the Japanese blues scene, it turns out, is sort of supercharged when when uh, Charles Kyle's book, uh, uh, Urban Blues, is sort of reprinted there um, in uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. One of my authors is going to write about that. So that's that's the second stage, is sort of is sort of the ideas about the blues and the way that European blues scholars, followed by American blues scholars, are framing the performers who were coming in, in these terms, coming to Europe in these terms. Number three, but so far we're mostly in, so far we're mostly in Europe and the UK. Number three, the, and this is key, the British blues scene achieves critical mass, the first non-black, non-US cohort to do so. Think about what that means. Before you have a white American blues scene, or before you have white American musicians like Butterfield and Bloomfield it, it, that have any kind of public visibility, you've got a thriving blues scene erupting in England, in the UK. And it's driven by the fact that Brunsey and Josh White and others have visited there, Leadbelly have visited there in the, in the ten years preceding 1960. There's, you, be, you get a sort of transatlantic uh, a flow happening. And so the British people come to America and say, don't you know who your own heroes are? Um, you get a kind of black fathers and white sons dynamic. You get albums. You get Fleetwood Mac's Blues Jam in Chicago. You get B.B. King in London, the London Howlin' Wolf sessions, the London Muddy Water sessions, all in the late 60s, early 70s. And then what you get is you get Cream, you get the Rolling Stones being broadcast through British radio, American radio, and so the image that a lot of people in other places around the world begin to get of the blues 
he isn't just straight muddy waters howlin wolf the kind you know uh bessie smith it's the white boys doing their own rock blues transformations of that that's this is one of the the, the, the discoveries that I made that I it needs a lot more work somebody needs to come along and think this through but here's something else that's really important so the image of the blues as it spreads um, to Singapore for example and I'm going to talk about that in a sec the image of the blues is an image that's it's about guys with guitars it's about bands images and and and, and that's partly the cream the rolling stone so it's blues rock it's guys with guitars it's bands it's as much white as it is black which is interesting as blues spreads around the world and it's not nearly as much about women one of the things that frustrated the hell out of me researching this project was that I just didn't find a lot when I when I like Michael Limnios is Michael Limnios is a Greek uh, a j blues journalist slash scholar who has a lot of articles about blues in different national contexts. It's a really important uh, uh, resource for me, and I've spoken with him. Great guy, great guy, doing really important work for trying to tell the story of the blues in global context. One of the things that, and so I, I found a lot of stuff by him. I found, you know, David DeCare has a book, More Blues Singers, Biographies of 50 Artists from the la Later 20th Century. David DeCare, a book that came out in 2002, capsule portraits of a whole series of people, including Jean-Jacques Milteau and, and um, other people that I write about. No women. No women in, in representing blues in international context. There's an absence of work. There, 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 there are some around the edges. You know, we know the women are out there, but they're not, they're not as, as what's the word, as vi not nearly as visible as the men when one tries to tell the story of blues in international context. So there's, that's something that ripe, it's ripe for somebody to do some work on this. I just couldn't, the sources were not there. Um, but I'm sure stuff's out there, and we need oral histories. If you're somebody who can tell the story of women in your national scene, very important, very important. So the, the, the British scene, that's part number three. So now we get to the interesting part, the sort of, we've gone through African-American artists and their recordings and films about them. That's stage one. British and European blue scholars framing all that stuff. That sort of helps for, for the rest of the world. That sort of helps tell the story of the blues for the first time. Um, before American scholars are really doing that. Um, number three is, what did I say number three? The British blues scene then achieves critical mass and, and so it begins to be one of the prime ways through which blues are spread around the world now. It's not just about black American blues musicians, it's about the white boys who've been listening to them and adapting their music and spreading it. Cream, Rolling Stones. Number four, beginning as early as the mid-1960s and as late, in some cases, as the first decade of the new millennium. Significantly inflected by developments in the U.S. and U.K., blue scenes develop in most other regions of the world. North America, including Canada and Mexico, don't forget about them. South America, all over South America. Europe, including Russia. Asia, including India, China, and Japan, although India is really late. It's like it doesn't really start to happen with the blues scene until after the turn of the millennium. Interesting, the differential sort of dates at which scenes become scenes. Fascinating, fascinating when you try to tell the story. The Middle East, Israel, for example, Australia, thriving blues scene, and Africa, including South Africa. One of the things I stumbled across was this incredible resource that offers that sort of like tour date. It was a BB King resource. It's like is it tourdates.com? I, I I don't have it at at, at, at hand right now. BB King is hugely important when we're trying to tell the story of how the blues of how blues music spreads around the world. Of course, his autobiography, which comes out in the in 1996 97, is called Blues All Around Me. But BB King, more than any other individual artist, I think by far. He's the one who tours everywhere. He, he goes to at least, and the thing I found basically had his tour dates in 57 different countries. And you can sort of go th track through them to the earliest recorded tour date. I'm sure it's not complete, but I'm sure it's representative, broadly representative. And there were some fascinating things. Like, where does B.B. King, where, where, does, where does he go? His five most popular destinations ranked by total number of performances are, after the U.S., are Canada, Japan, the UK, Germany, and France. Now, did you know Japan was his number three tour destination? That might help explain why blues is so big in Japan. 
But there's lots of other evidence, including Michael Urban's book, Russia Gets the Blues, about the sort of transformative effect. The first time B.B. King went to Russia, it was sort of post-Soviet. It was just, they were trying to figure out who Russians were now that it was no longer the Soviet Union. They really felt like something had broken apart. It was, and they loved his music. And it single-handedly jump-started a blues scene in Russia. My, my research tells me that King is hugely important and that if you look at the date when King first played a given place, it can tell you something about the, well, what does it take to bring B.B. King to your country? To some extent, it takes an active blues scene, potentially, which is to say people who know his music. And so if you track the, those dates, this was, again, exploratory scholarship. This is like, and I love doing this kind of thing. Like, I, you, I, if you write on Shakespeare, everybody and their brother and their grandfather and great, great, great grandfather's written on Shakespeare. What do you say new? But if you're writing about blues in global context, it's like tracking into the waste. I feel like I'm heading off to Antarctica or the, the North Pole or something like that. In South America, King debuts in Brazil and Argentina in 1980, more than a decade before he plays Chile. So if you were to think about, well, did like Brazil, um, Brazil and Argentina had blue scenes ahead of Chile. Chile, that's interesting. Well, why? Well, either because King came or the fact that he came showed that that was more developed. So it's not clear to me, you know, what's cause and what's and what's merely two things happening in sequence. And then there's Asia. King plays Japan, right, for the first time in 1971, returns often, but he doesn't play Taiwan until 1990, Malaysia 1992, Singapore 1992, Hong Kong 1994. He plays China only once at the opening of the Hard Rock Cafe Beijing. You can see there's just too much. You've got to get my article. You've got to download it. Um, King never plays India. I could, I could find no evidence. It's not on his tour charts. I googled like crazy trying to find, did he ever play India? No. And the Indian blues scene starts really late. Rudy Walang, the, the, the band's soulmate. Um, there's a lot of interesting Indian blues players, but they'll talk about how there just was nothing going on, and they had to kind of make it happen. Now, that's four stages. I have two more stages. Number five, stage five. And this is really important. It'd be easy to forget about this, but as I began to sort of think through, it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, at a certain point, you've got the musicians in India and, and in Japan, and they come to America, some of them do. What does that do to the whole, like, global spread of the music? Number five, non-U.S. UK, non-U.S. or U.K. blues musicians visit the United States as long-term emigres, as shorter-term sojourners or pilgrims, as competitors in the International Blues Challenge, and participate in U.S. blues culture and engendering a complex exchange with significant ramifications. Such a fascinating thing to think about this, right? It starts with blues scholars from Europe who come, documentarians, they come to Chicago, they come to New Orleans, St. Louis, looking to encounter blues in the flesh. Peps Person from Sweden comes, that has an album called The Week Peps Came to Chicago, out in 72, jams with all these famous African-American blues musicians, Sonny Land Slim, Carrie Bell. Japanese blues musicians is a big thing. There's Shun Kikuda, Shoji Nato, Taro Senga, Sumito Ario Arioshi, we'll talk about them. Walter Linigo from Switzerland comes and, you know, settles in Mississippi. Um, tours with James Son Thomas. Javier Vargas, there's somebody that many people might not have heard of, but if you've heard of Javier Vargas, guy does a series of albums, comes to, to he, he's, um, he's uh, from Spain, does albums, Madrid, Memphis, Blues Latino, Texas Tango, so just, in his case, he's not trying to learn the real stuff so much as create these kind of really interesting flavored melanges, sort of global blues, you know, a fusion blues, if you will. It's really interesting. Ori Naftali, who's in a, a, a group called uh, Southern Avenue, an Israeli blues guitarist from Tel Aviv. So there's just, and then of course the International Blues Challenge, um, which brings people sort of every year, it kind of collects this global blues community. Do you see what an interesting story this is? Fantastic. So that's stage five, is basically people who have been produced by these non-U.S. blues scenes come to America. And here's number six. With the fusing of digital sound reproduction technologies and the World Wide Web epitomized by iTunes and YouTube, the globalization of blues music has entered a new era. Well, hello, that, you, you're with me, right? 13 years, Gusso on YouTube, so I'm part of this element of it, and I, that's one thing that made it easy for me to think about it, I suppose. 
But if you start to think about how do blues musicians find their publics, it used to be a very retail thing. I mean, and you needed a promoter to bring you somewhere if, if you're moving from one country to another, which means you had to have a reputation. Now, you have the example of Luna Lee. You can be a South Korean YouTuber supported by subscribers on Patreon who spend, you know, a dollar or five dollars, and you have a thousand of them, that's a thousand dollars a month, and you produce some videos. And you put them on YouTube, and somebody like me, Schmo from Mississippi, interested in international blues and scholarship, can find you and bring you to the attention of, well, folks like folks like you, my YouTube audience. So what does all this do? Well it it it, it the fact that something's gone global doesn't mean that the local doesn't have meaning or value, quite the reverse. The global thing means that people are kind of fascinated by, let's say, the real deal down-home Mississippi blues artists who aren't on the internet. It, 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 it sheds light on the local. Um, it adds a new kind of value in some sense. There's always people who are a little bit off the grid, and then there's, you know, scholars who are uh, raving uh, before cameras and, and putting it around the world. So that's where we are. Um, I, I've gone on, I've raved and raved. I, I don't really want to take you through each of the seven articles that I have, but let me do that really quickly anyway, if I might, um, so that you know what you'll be getting. Again, my article's free. I urge you to go hit the first link uh, down in the, in the info pane for this video. Hit it, you, it'll take you to a place you can just download the PDF. Print it out or just read it on your, read it on your iPad. And, you know, and let me know what you think. I'm sh quite sure I haven't gotten all the pieces in place, but I have tried. It's, I've made a good faith attempt to put all the pieces, spread them all on the table, basically, and then try to find some order that seems to make sense, but it's very provisional. It's going to be, somebody will write a book, not me. Somebody will write a book. They'll explain all the places that, that I went wrong, but that's okay. We need to tell this story. So, I'm going to just read you the titles of seven, and I'm going to give you my, my 25 words or less seven articles in this journal. First article after my introduction is called Songhoi Blues, Using the Blues to Navigate Geopolitical Conflict in Mali and Music Industry Landscapes by Kirthi Chandrashikar. Again, a Mumbai-born scholar, Southern Studies scholar from here at the University of Mississippi. And he ended up becoming the road manager for Songhoi Blues, so he really knows this. Songhoi Blues is a Malian group they were forced to flee from the northern part of the country down to the southern part of the country. So they and it's an article about how they position themselves in a globalized blues market. Also, how their music works within very local contexts in an Afri a contemporary African country that has religious violence going on. Uh, because basically, the Muslim clerics in the north part of the country said, "You may not play your guitars. You may not play secular music." So. You know, we think the blues comes from Africa. Well, some of it does, but it's made under local conditions it, with highly kind of individuated political landscapes. There's a political economy at work, and the music fits within that. And if we just sort of talk about the blues came from Africa, we're missing this incredibly rich story. So he's going to tell that story. The second essay by a Senegalese scholar, Babakar Mbai, is called Charting Am Aminata Falls Cosmopolitanism, a comparative study of African-American and Senegambian blues lyrics. So he's a scholar of uh, African music and African culture. Aminata Fall is an African, a woman from Senegal, from San Louis, Senegal, who grew up in a very cosmopolitan musical environment with currents of music that were, you know, music from Europe and the UK, music from America that might have come through Europe and the UK, um, an incredibly rich sonic environment, touring it, uh, blues, but especially sort of jazz bands that came through Africa. So if we imagine Africa is sort of like a dusty place with huts, you know, where people are strumming on zithers, that, that her Africa is an entirely different thing. And what, what Mbai does is he looks at her blues lyrics and he finds parallels in the way that she sings, mm -hmm. some of the, mm, the sort of vocative thing, sound she makes that remind him of, of um, Robert Johnson, but he's sort of, it's a, it's a very careful attempt. Some of the themes that she raises early in the morning, he, she, he, he, she has a blues that's very much like uh, early in the morning blues in America. He's going to talk about this sort of currents of, of, of cultural flow back and forth across the Black Atlantic that, that are really ancient. They're old. 
So we, we make a mistake if we imagine that the flow of uh, that created the blues is basically African cultural materials coming to America, and that's it, the sum total. No, it goes both ways, and he, he's going to give you that. That's the, that's the second article. The third is called, These songs are going to be sung all over this world, Josh White, Big Bill Brunsey, and the Tangled Roots of Folk Blues in Early Post-War Britain. So I remember visiting the UK in uh, 2000. 12, I think, and meeting Chris Barber, who was in his early 80s, just a balding white man with an elegant accent and, and, and a slightly kooky edge, who was a trombone player and an extremely important person in the British blues scene because he brought Big Bill Brunsey, he was the head of like a jazz organization, brought Brunsey for the first time to England. And that's what he said. He sat across from me and he goes, we'd, seen, we'd, never, we'd never seen anything like it. You know, it all began with Big Bill Brunsey. And, and that was a sort of guide for me as I moved through this project. So what, what Lawrence Davies does, he's an English scholar, UK scholar, what he does is he looks at the ideas that British blues fans used to frame the performances by Josh White, who came in 1950, and Big Bill Brunsey in 1951. They tended to see Josh White as an urban sophisticate, even though he's from South Carolina and used to, he used to walk around behind, I think, Blind Blake? Was it Josh White, part of Cafe Society in New York? So they, they saw Josh White as, in some cases, a little too sophisticated, a little too, not the real down-home thing. They saw Big Bill Brunsey as Mr. Mississippi in his overalls and brogans, right? And the truth is much more complex than this. And so Josh White, it turned out, what really loved to hang out backstage and play his real blues stuff for the audiences after the big show was over. And, and knew how to, not manipulate, but knew how to seduce this new British audience. And Big Bill Brunsey, of course, was somebody who had actually had uh, a, a fairly sophisticated thing going on in Chicago, and he was an urban blues man who retrofitted himself as what they wanted him to be. And it's really about the fact that they both, in some sense, had a kind of cosmopolitan I was going to use a French phrase, savoir-faire. They kind of knew what was up, and they knew how to work their audiences. And they were always a step ahead of the British blues aficionados, the fans, the journalists, who thought that they understood how to place them. It's a really interesting hip article. Another one, Roberta Freund Schwartz, a woman who wrote a book called Britain Gets the Blues, uh, How Britain Got the Blues. I was lucky to have her. She wrote something called From Blue Horizon to Sadisk, Independent Record Labels in the British Blues Revival. It's fascinating. It's a kind of... On the one hand, she gives you great history, cultural history, about the British blues scene um, during this early period, kind of how it worked. She reminds us, for example, that between 19... What was it? 49 and 1960, it was, it was not only expensive to import American blues recordings into England. It was illegal. It was technically illegal. And so she gives a sense of what kind of scene grows up. It's very homegrown. It's usually blues scholars who don't give their name. Um, it's very quirky. It doesn't seem, it's not for profit. It's like most of these labels would put out a hundred records and then you had to be one of the, the real insiders to even know how to order them. They'd be in little sort of anonymous kind of ads. So it's it's a fast, it offers fascinating insight into how that whole British blues scene got critical mass. And it was partly a real kind of cottage industry of little labels. Um, but with, there's a whole lot more detail to it. The next essay by Scott Beretta. He, he is a scholar and he was a former editor of Jefferson, which is the, the oldest European blues magazine. It's the Swedish blues magazine and Living Blues the oldest uh, continuing publication in American Blues Magazine, and he's written something pioneering, which is sort of a, a history of the Swedish blues scene, how it worked, who were the key figures. One of the key figures is a guy named Ole, Ole Hel Helander. I'm sure my Swedish uh, friends in the audience here are going to tell me I pronounced it wrong. Ole Helander, who was with Sverij Radio, it was basically Swedish radio, came to Chicago, got incredible interviews in the mid-60s, with or early 60s, with like everybody in, Ch in black Chicago blue circles. Brought it, got great sound quality because of Swedish modern kind of technology, brought it back and did a series of shows that were called I Blues Quarter, In the Blues Quarters, which blew the mind of a series of people who became ultimately very important figures in the Swedish blues scene. 
So here's like one more angle of the blues international story. And so I, I knew very little about the Swedish blues scene except that they did it uh, did indeed have one. You'll learn you'll learn everything you, you you never knew about that Swedish blues scene and about the figures in it. Did Swedish blues performers sing in English or did they sing in various Swedish regional accents? Well, it turns out that some of them decided, you know, for a Swedish man to sing the blues is it's not really authentic. Um, but if I sing blues in my native dialect, like North Country Swedish dialect, um, Ska, Skana, Deep South Skana accent. Okay, so that's what they did, is they, they created their own thing with the help of the blues, finding authenticity within a local scene. Now, one of my favorite articles in this whole thing, and I kept telling them it's going to be great, it's going to be great, it is. It's called I Am Not the Blues Man, Authenticity and Identity of a Japanese Pianist in the Chicago Blues Community. Do you know who Ario is? Sumito Ariyoshi, aka Ario, is one of the great living Chicago Blues Pianists. He's a native of Japan. He came in the 1980s, I guess? early 1980s, so he's been in, in Chicago for a long time. He's been playing in Billy Branch's band for f almost 15 years, I think, at this point. He played with Jimmy Rogers early on, Valerie Wellington, the late Valerie Wellington, a young uh, a, a Chicago blues, a blues queen. He's played with everybody. He's recorded with, with a lot of people. And it's his confessions. It's a long interview. It's like an interview that, that contextualizes the interview. And it also offers a complete kind of history of the, or a capsule history, pretty good first pass history of the blues in Japan. I knew nothing about that. It's fascinating, fascinating. But the most interesting thing is, what's it like to be a Japanese born elder in the Chicago blues scene? And you get a kind of bitterness in some cases. He, he, he says basically, if you're a Japanese man, you're the lowest on the totem pole. Even the, a, a, a young Japanese woman who comes and plays sax is sort of snapped up. It, he's not saying I don't get no respect, but he does say when he tours with Billy Branch's band in Europe, the Swiss promoter or German promoter doesn't want two Japanese guys in the photo. Because when German or the Swiss bring American blues from Chicago, they want black people in the photo. Imagine how it feels to be this guy. So he's got his own very curious um, kind of long-term Japanese relocatee. Uh, uh, he's not a sojourner. He's really an emigre. He's a naturalized kind of American at this point. But he can't go get no respect. Well, he does finally get respect. And so that's the. It tells. But it tells a story of just how rocky, how much tension there is within a within a Chicago blues scene in which the the some black bands and so, and many white club owners don't necessarily want to see. Japanese guys on stage, or too many Japanese guys on stage, right? And certainly not as a band leader. And yet, at this point, he's a survivor. He really knows the music. And so he's become a kind of teacher and mentor to younger players, including some younger black players who come along and want to learn the real Chicago blues. And there he is. It's a fascinating, fascinating. There's really nothing quite like this. Um, and we've got it now. And finally, seventh and final piece. I know I've gone on way too long. I just had to do this. Um, it's called The Africadian Blues, A Conversation with George Eliot Clark. Now, you've never heard of George Eliot Clark? You have no idea what Africadian means? So, this is the one nod to blues literature. George Eliot Clark is a native of Nova Scotia, a small town in Nova Scotia. He's a black Canadian, so Africadian, but it's, it's, it, he's also a native of Acadia, right? Nova Scotia is part of Acadia. And he has a very distinct sense of his identity. And it's both very lo rooted and local and very cosmopolitan. So he's one of these people who thinks that Ezra Pound and um, all, you know various kinds of things that, that you would not instantly associate with the blues. He says it's all blues. It's all blues. And it's an extraordinary interview that my former grad student, who's, all, who's from Winnipeg and did a dissertation on blues and sort of North, North American blues, which included Canada. Um, he interviewed Clark, and Clark is just, 
once you read this stuff, you'll never forget this man. He, he's explosive. His conception of the blues just blows the door right off any narrow-minded understanding. But also, to talk about his position, how everywhere he goes, somebody assumes something about him that's wrong. So when he, when he crosses from Canada into America, to say I'm coming for a poetry reading, people assume he's bringing drugs, the, the border guards, they, they just don't know how to, what to make of a black Canadian po blues poet. And he talks about trying to find his audience in Canada and how it's important as a blues poet, if you're going to play for a black audience, it's got to give them something the way a preacher might give an audience something. So. It, it, that's sort of where this issue ends. Um, I've gone on way too long. Just what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to download my my piece, read it. It'll give you a sort of uh, a, a capsule description of each of these seven articles. It'll give you a much more detail in what I've gone through. Also, it'll have lots of footnotes and lots of sources in the work cited. So you can go if you want to do more research. Um, you want to see where I did my research. And if and and you know, I make a couple of. I make a couple of claims that I, I you know, I, I worried about them. I wondered if they were true. I say no substantial scholarly study has yet been published about the history and sociology of Canadian or Japanese blues. I mean, I found one article in uh, some Canadian encyclopedia about Canadian blues, but there's no monograph. Couldn't find it. If it's out there, you're a better scholar than Dr. Gusso, so by all means, find it. I would say the one that I did find on a sort of an, a, a national blues scene outside of America, well, bien el sir, Historia del Blues on La Argentina. Um, the only book-length scholarly monograph I've been able to identify that focuses on a national blues tradition outside of England, and I said there's been sort of some research in Europe, the Netherlands, France, Germany, Norway, Russia, but outside of that, not Japan, not, nothing in South America, nothing in Asia. So it's time for that, everybody. This is the first, um, it's a shot across the bow. I would like blue scholars, and you, whoever you are, probably know something that can be a part of this story. So maybe you can put that in the comments section. Tell me something I don't know if there's something. Again, I'm not writing this book. This article is, the, is what I'm writing. But I know that somebody needs to write a book. Maybe you can help them. So um, go and take a look at my work cited, and by all means, supplement in the comments section. Okay? It seems like I need to play a song. How about... Put your, you're going to download the article, right? Download the article. Send your friends to it. Find a university library that's going to let you download from JSTOR. Maybe you can do it at your local library. I don't know. Okay. Bye-bye.